Thank you, John. Good morning. I understand last time I was a little too loud, so let's, uh, let's, you throw your hands up and wave, whatever you need to do if I'm too loud. Can you hear me in the back? You able to hear me? You can't? Maybe you should move to the front. <laughs> Some backseat Baptists, you got to watch them. Twenty-one years ago, 9-11 took place, and most of us remember exactly where we were. Most of us remember exactly what we were doing. Most of us remember exactly who we were with. It, it seemed as if it wasn't real. Do you remember the day where you were and what it felt like? It felt like a dream. It felt like, you know, we're going to wake up from this and it's going to be different. But unfortunately, it wasn't a dream. It was reality. Al-Qaeda terrorists carried out a well-coordinated uh, well suicide attack strategy against the Twin Towers, the World Trade Center, uh, the Pentagon, and of course, other evil intentions, which I'll share a little bit of a, a thought on that in just a moment. You know the fourth plane that landed in, well, crash, I should say, in Somerset County. I talked to a first responder who was there just Three or four days after that, I saw him in Bellevue, which is just a suburb of Pittsburgh, and we began to talk, and he said, well, we don't know for sure, but that fourth plane, the Flight 93, that took place out of Newark, uh, New Jersey, was perhaps destined for Three Mile Island to hopefully breach one of the nuclear reactors so that it might spread clouds of nuclear waste or whatever, you know, fallout throughout the East Coast. That's one theory. The other theories would be the White House and the Capitol. But we know a, a group of dedicated men, we'll talk about them in just a few minutes, brave heroes, uh, undoubtedly by virtue of their heroic action there on Flight 93, literally uh, saved untold numbers of lives. We don't know how many. Had it been that nuclear actor, actor breach, it could have been thousands upon thousands upon thousands of lives that would have been compromised and perhaps many, many killed. So it was that morning, uh, I was in a staff meeting in our church, leading our staff in uh, our activity and our ministry for the week. And... Um, as we were there, we were alerted to the fact that something had taken place. At 8.50 a.m., White House Chief of Staff alerted President George W. Bush that a plane had hit the World Trade Center. 9.03, hijackers crashed yet another plane, Flight 175, into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. At 9.08 on that day, the FFA determined that uh, no flights could come in and out of New York City and other uh, major cities were beginning to take similar precautions as to the fact that it seemed as if we were under attack. At 9.31 that day, President Bush calls the event an apparent terroristic attack upon our country. 9.37, the hijackers, uh, Al-Qaeda hijackers, uh, crashed yet another plane on the west side of the Pentagon, killing uh, 59 aboard and 125 civilians, as well as uh, high-end classified military uh, personnel. Evacuations began to take place in New York City, Washington, D.C. We were in Pittsburgh. They shut down the towers, or the, excuse me, the tunnels. They shut down main arteries in and out of the city at that point in time. There were some college students from down in Duquesne could not get anywhere, so they ended up staying with us for a period of time. 10.07, uh, Flight 93 learned of what was taking place. I think it was probably through... Uh, text messaging, perhaps some phones were actually working, and uh, they were told of the events of what had taken place. And so these men, under the direction of a young man by the name of Todd Beamer, took it upon themselves to say, this isn't going to happen the way you've planned it to happen. And so they thought through a strategy, and they together collectively said the Lord's Prayer. And at that point, Todd uttered the words, let's roll. Let's roll. You should read the book. We're not sure exactly all that transpired, but of course we know that in Somerset County that uh, 
flight, Flight 93, careened into the ground. And again, probably saving literally thousands upon thousands upon thousands of lives. We believe that we actually heard that low-flying aircraft in our staff meeting in Pittsburgh as it circled from Cleveland, making its way back towards Washington, D.C., or toward Three Mile Island. Very, very sad day indeed in our nation's history. Thousands have died. We think of approximately 3,000 on that day, but I have a friend who joined us on our mission trip this year who was a first responder in New York City, and he has said since that time, people, due to their exposure to all kinds of toxins and this and that, in the rescue efforts, it's up to about 5,500 people who've died as a result of, of the, the, the attack on 9-11. Firemen, policemen, EMT, paramedics, risking life itself in hopes of recovery, and then, of course, uh, going after the folks who had unfortunately perished. I was at Ground Zero about nine and a half months ago with a friend of mine in New York City. I purchased this hat there. Uh, I bought him one as well. I've used it uh, uh, on some of our missions work and so forth. But you can't see it from where you're seated, but right here it says, never forget. Never forget. So today we've entitled my message, that very thing, never, never forget. Now what are some observations that we can make concerning 9-11's attack on America? First is simply this. Let's see if we can pull it up here. Do we have it on the screen or do we not? We do not? Okay. You've got notes in front of you. Look at your notes if you would, please. Observation number one is this. Unregenerate, non-believing people plan and do unregenerate evil acts. Al-Qaeda has a belief system that is intolerant toward Christianity. It views the United States of America as the great Satan that must be eradicated. That's their belief. That's their doctrine. And listen, there will be no peace upon this earth. Uh, evil will continue until the return of Jesus Christ as he returns for us as King of kings and Lord of lords. He's coming in his first uh, part of that coming. We call it the rapture, which could happen at any moment. They call it the imminency of his return, meaning he could return at any moment. And I trust that you're ready, by the way. He's coming again. The fact that he came the first time is a guarantee he'll come again. But just a little time after that, he'll come back as King of kings and Lord of lords, and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And all those things that are crooked will be made straight, and all those wrongs will be made right. So we need to understand that uh, this side of his second coming there will be no end to evil until he comes as the sovereign Lord and King that he is. Secondly, observation number two is this. Nothing in this world is secure, certain, or safe apart from being in Christ. Let me repeat that. Nothing in this world is certain, secure, and safe apart from being in Christ. Think about it for just a moment. If the World Trade Centers and the Pentagon are, are vulnerable, where can you and I go for safety? We have, listen to me, we have eternal safety and security and shelter in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Amen? There is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The question is this morning, are you in Christ? Have you embraced the gospel? Have you embraced Jesus for who he is? Do you believe that he died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day? Are you trusting in him completely for your eternal salvation? If not, you're not in a very good place. You're not in a secure place. You're vulnerable. We have eternal safety and security and shelter in the redemptive work of our Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, what he's done for us. Thirdly, in terms of an observation, God can and does bring beauty 
out of the ashes of tragedy. I'm going to grab some water here real quick. Do you mind? We used to actually use holy water up at El- where, we, where I pastored. You know how to get holy water? You put it on the stove and you boil the devil out of it. That's how you get holy water. <laughs> Observation number three. God can and does bring beauty out of ashes of tragedy. We see oftentimes on TV tunnels to towers how this Mr. Seller has created an environment a nonprofit that's literally helping servicemen and other people impacted by 9-11 to have their own homes debt-free. That's, that's a good thing, right? That's beauty out of ashes. I think of Todd Beamer and his friends there on 93, uh, Flight 93, saving thousands of lives. Again, records as best we have it is the fact that they did indeed quote the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven. And then after they had completed that prayer, They went into action, and undoubtedly, countless thousands of lives were saved. Todd, earlier that morning, as he drove into the Newark airport, we're told, according to the book, was involved in a scripture memory program like the Navigators would sponsor. If you've been to college and maybe you bumped into the Navigators, you know who they are. It's a great organization, produce all kinds of great Christian literature and, and helps for discipleship. So he had this scripture memory packet in between the console of his car. And on the very top card, which he read that morning before boarding uh, Flight 93, was uh, uh, Romans chapter 11, verses 36 through 38. Listen to what it says. All the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond finding out. Who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor? For from him and through him and to him be all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. That's what Todd had read that morning before boarding Flight 93. You see, faith in the living God enabled him to do what he needed to do. And as that flight descended in the fields of Somerset County, undoubtedly Todd's soul spirit, along with those who knew and loved Jesus Christ, as it was going down, they were going up. That's what the Bible teaches, absent from the body, present with the Lord. That's what we had to look forward to. There's coming a, a great getting up day, right? When Christ comes again and he's going to resurrect the dead in Christ. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the first trump. And the dead in Christ will be those who are raised first. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up along with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall forever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So as the flight descended down, the soul spirit of Todd and others who knew and loved Christ ascended upward. This is what the Bible says. This is the record. This is the testimony. God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. But he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Again, I was there at 9-11 just not that long ago, and What was so striking was the two words, never forget. As I looked at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of names upon the the, the plaques that surrounded the reflecting pool, it was as if those names were saying to me, never forget. As our present administration in reality pushes for lax policies on the illegal flow of unvetted, undocumented aliens through our southern border. It's as if those verses were saying to me, never forget. Many coming up through the south are not just from Latin American countries, they're from Middle Eastern countries with perhaps not the best of intentions. And so we must, as a, as a people, as a church, as a nation, never forget. As we broker energy deals with people in faraway countries that despise our country, I hear those words echoing my ears, never forget. Never forget. 
As I see our nation that's been built upon Judeo-Christian ideals and principles being dismantled by liberals and media and university professors and social influencers, I hear the words echoing in my ears, never, ever forget. We can't be asleep at the wheel, folk. Let me just encourage you, November for us as a nation is pivotal. It's absolutely essential that you do what you must do to let your voice be heard. Now, I didn't, I didn't endorse any particular person, but if you've got your thinking cap on, I think you know what you must do, amen? We want to continue to be the home of the free. So I remember, and we, Encounter those hard things in life, things that are hard to understand, hard to explain. When we're trying to navigate those uh, uh, unexpected turns in life, the unimaginable things that strike the tragedies. We think of what's just happened, for example, in eastern Kentucky. We think of what happened in Pittsburgh about three years ago there at the Tree of Life Synagogue. We, We must remember certain things. We must not forget certain things. And the first thing that I want you to note, you can see it in your notes as well, never forget God is near. Never forget God is near. Let me give you a scripture for that. Psalm 145, 18. Psalm 145, 18. I think it's perhaps listed there. It is. It says these words. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. James chapter 4, verse 8 says, draw near to God. And as you draw near to God, he draws near to us. So life at times is hard. We all encounter difficult trials of uh, numerous sorts, and there seems to be unanswerable, unanswerable randomness to life at times. That's when we cry out to God, we reveal our heart, we reveal our confusion, we reveal our pain, and though perhaps he might seem absent, he's never far away. We must never interpret our numbness as his absence. God, through His Son, the Lord Jesus, said this word to us just before He ascended into heaven. He says, Lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Never forget, friend, God is near. Second thing we must not forget is this. God listens and loves you. God listens and loves you. This is a key truth. Listen to Max Lucado. He's a devotional writer. Some of you perhaps are familiar with his words. Listen to what he says here. Your words do not stop until they reach the very throne of God. One call and heaven's fleet appears. Now get this. Your prayers on earth activates God's power in heaven. That's beautiful, isn't it? Your prayers on earth activates God's power in heaven. Listen to the scriptures. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15 says these words. This is the record. This is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. Jeremiah 33 verse 3 says these words, call unto me, I'll answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Now, I know I don't look this old, but I'm old. Anybody else identify? Okay. I buried 200 foot of water line Thursday and Friday, and my body's starting to talk to me. My brain says I can do it. My body says I'm not sure you can. So maybe you can relate to that to some measure. So anyhow, I've got three kids and 11 grandkids. One of her granddaughters is from Ukraine. She was adopted eight years ago and just graduated from high school. We thank God for her, Catherine. But my little six-year-old Arlo, is it Arlo Jesse, isn't it? He's named after me, that's right, I forgot the middle name. See, I told you I was getting old. But anyhow, uh, we started talking, second day of school when Deb and I were with him, Arlo, who's the smartest kid in your class? 
He said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, I'll tell you who the most popular kid is. I said, who? He said, Jackson. I said, why is Jackson so popular? Because he wears a gold chain. He could do a handstand against the wall. <laughs> Guess what I'm buying Arlo for Christmas? A gold chain, probably. I don't know. He said, I'm the cutest. That was kind of cool. But anyhow, you know, we've got kids. We love them. I tell you what, I would do anything, anything for all three of my adult children or my 11 grandchildren. When they hurt, I hurt. And I pray and I intercede and I do what I possibly can. And this is the response of a, of a finite, imperfect, flawed father. If, if, if I feel that way, how much more does our Father in heaven feel towards us when we find ourselves in those situations where we just can't make sense out of it all? And, and that's why he says to us, call unto me. Call unto me, I'll answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things you do not know. He hears his children, he loves his children, and yes, he loves to hear from his children. I don't care what time, day or night, if one of my grandkids or kids calls me, uh, I drop everything and I'm there for them. And again, this is a flawed, imperfect, a finite father. How much more do we have in our loving Father in heaven? Listen, we must not ever forget. You've got a picnic here, don't you? I'll be done by 145 just to let you know. Just kidding, just kidding. Come on. Can you smile for me? Come on. Just smile. Come on. Come on. It's not going to hurt. Never forget God is near. Never forget. God listens and he loves you. Thirdly, never forget, God knows about your circumstances. He's never caught off guard. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't slumber. And he says to us these words, for those who of us that know his son, do not fear, Isaiah 41, 10. Do not fear, I'm with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In the hard moments of life, what does he do? He promises this in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 30 and 31. He says these words basically. He says, listen, I give you courage to run, and I give you strength to finish. In essence, is what he's saying. 9-11 fixed in our minds two words, never forget. Never forget that God is near. He says, call unto me and I will answer you. Never forget that he listens and he loves you. Never forget that God knows your circumstances. And lastly, never forget God gives promises for our future. Again, the last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples, he says, as you're going about sharing the gospel, as you're going about discipling men and women and children, Teach them to observe all that I've commanded you, and, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's a promise. As you make disciples baptizing, he says, lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. What are some other words that speak to our future for those of us who know and love Jesus Christ? Just hours before he died, he said these words. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that, that where I am, there you may be also. One of the disciples was confused and said, where are you going and how can we know the way? Jesus responds in the most beautiful, succinct way. He says, I am the way. I'm the way of access to the Father. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Down there where we work, just about three and a half hours south of here, Many years ago in the 50s, there was a man from Chicago. And he was driving, and he was just taken back by the poverty there in southern West Virginia, down around McDowell County. And he saw in the 50s a little boy playing in a mud hole. He was driving his big black sedan, and he was just 
stunned by what he had seen and witnessed. And so he stopped that black sedan and he got out of the sedan and he said, son, do, do you live in that, that house across the creek? He said, yes, sir. I live in that house. But tomorrow, I'm moving to my new house on the hill where the view is better and the air is cleaner and everything is brand spanking new. That's what death is for the Christian. He's gone to prepare a place. And if he goes to prepare a place, he's coming again where the view is better, where the air is cleaner, and where everything is brand spanking new. That's what death is for the Christian. That's what we have to look forward to. Should not be afraid of that at all. A.W. Tozier, who pastored for a period of time down in Park, or Clarksburg, West Virginia, many years ago, wrote these words. Let no one apologize for the powerful emphasis Christianity lays upon the doctrine of the world to come. Right there lies its immense, immense superiority to everything within the whole sphere of human thought and experience. Now listen to this. We would do well to think of the long tomorrow. We would do well to think of the long tomorrow. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that, listen, that love him. Do you love him this morning? Do you know him? One other quote, and with that I'll close. C.S. Lewis wrote these words. If you read history, you will find that the Christians that did the most for this present world were those who thought the most of the next. Aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at the earth and you'll get neither. Would you bow with me as we pray? Well, friend, never forget Our Lord's returning, and the promises He has given us are true, they're solid, rock solid. And if you do not know Christ, today should be your day. Right there where you're seated, you can just say these words. If it's from your heart and you truly mean them and believe them, dear Lord Jesus, I believe you to be the Son of God. And yes, Lord, I, I believe that 2,000 years ago you died on that cross for me, for my sins. I believe that you arose from the dead, and right now, as best I know how, dear Lord Jesus, I'm placing my full and complete faith and trust in you. Come into my life, forgive me my sins, make me a part of your forever family. Friend, if that's your prayer today, allow me to be the very first to welcome you to the family of God. The Bible says it like this, but as many as received him, that is Christ, he gives the right the power, the authority to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to watch another clip that sort of solidifies the things we've talked about this morning. Dear, Go Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. It's sure, it's steadfast, it gives us the hope and confidence that we need as we face somewhat of an uncertain future, at least from our vantage point. We know you're not taken by surprise, and we know you are sovereign, and Lord, there's coming a day. We're looking forward to it. When all those wrongs will be made right, and, and you will come, and every knee will bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of the Father. And God's people said, Amen.